Welcome to Skip the Queue, a podcast for people working in or working with visitor attractions. I'm your host, Kelly Molson. Each episode, I speak with industry experts from the attractions world. In today's episode, I'm joined by two guests, Lucy Dowding, Head of Marketing, and Sue Pendington, Sustainability Manager at Holcomb Estates. We discuss the wonder of Holcomb, their exciting sustainability plans, and how they translate to the visitor experience. If you like what you hear, you can subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, and all the usual channels by searching Skip the Queue. Lucy, Sue, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. It is, it's such a pleasure to have you on. I'm really excited about what we're going to talk about today. Thank you for inviting us. Very welcome. But as you know, because I know that you've listened to the podcast, we always start off with our icebreaker round. So Lucy, I'm going to start with you first. Can you tell me what your favourite movie quote is? Oh, that's really hot. I think most probably this is a really trashy movie, but I love it. Um, it would be from It's Complicated, Gary <laughs> Meryl Streep. And it is, it's too complicated. It's complicated, isn't it? It's that whole, it, it's complicated. And just that whole thing about life and it's a bit of a giggle. That it, yeah, it's complicated, but with a smile on your face. Uh, oh, Lucy, um, I think that kind of sums up 2020, right? It's complicated. <laughs> complicated. Definitely. That's how we will look back on this. <laughs> so I've got one for you. If you could travel back in time, what period would you go to and why? Wow. Uh, gosh, you don't half pose him. Um, do you know, it's, I'd say it's really quite soppy. I'd love to go, I lost my dad when I was 15 and I would love to rewind and actually talk to him about what he did as a job. Uh, and he, he spent loads of time traveling. He took early retirement sort of through in the Thatcher era, really. And he did loads of traveling around South America. Uh, and I would love to, you know, at the time I, I was a flippant teenager who didn't really care, but I would love to know what he did as a job and then more about all of his travels around the world. Oh, so that is such a lovely answer. What, yeah, what a wonderful thing to be able to do. That would be perfect, wouldn't it? It's funny, isn't it? You don't, you know, when you're at that age, you just don't fully appreciate or ask the right questions, do you? Because you don't know. No, that's right. In that, in that zone. And then the other one would be the 1730s to see Holcomb Hall being built. That'd be pretty cool. That would be super cool. And that's a super good answer for this podcast as well. <laughs> I feel like Sue prepared that one. <laughs> okay. Um, Sue, uh, back to you again. Have you ever met any of your idols? I don't think so. Maybe. In, the, in 2012, I was lucky enough to go to London uh, to the Olympics and my sister was working uh for CNN and so we got to go behind the scenes for like um, one of the interviews and I met the two rowers Helen Glover and um, Heather Stanning who had won gold that day so that was pretty cool I think and now um, Heather's uh, married to uh, Steve Irwin who my son is a big fan of and incidentally they're both coming to Sportfest at Holcomb next year. Oh so this is this could happen next year yeah amazing but yeah so I met yeah I met Heather uh 2012 and touched her gold medal wow (laughs) that's really impressive I've never even seen a gold medal up close great answer they're they're pretty big they're pretty weighty as well yeah I would imagine them to be quite heavy you don't see people just wandering around with them do you you know no and at the time they had no idea the significance of the impact and you know they were just in an absolute bubble it was it was special time Oh, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Lucy, back to you. I want to know, I've been a bit mean here. Sorry. What are you, what's something that you're not very good at? (laughs) (laughs) Mine's ironing. (laughs) Terrible. Yeah, that could be that as well. (laughs) Oh, digging. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Not great at digging as my husband tells me. Um, yeah. Does this have to happen quite a lot in your in your yeah, life? No, yeah, no, I've got a vegetable garden. Yeah, oh, yeah complete lockdown. Uh, vegetable garden. Um, yes, yeah, so we've been digging and apparently I'm not that great at it. I haven't got the right action. Chopping, there's a, there's a theme here. So chopping wood, not very good at it. Um, so I think I'm better, you know, cooking. 
cooking anything that comes out of the veg garden. I can light a fire so I can do things. Yeah, but yeah, general, general sort of um, hardy maintenance outside. (laughs) (laughs) Which interestingly fits in probably quite well with the topic of what we're going to talk about today in terms of sustainability. (laughs) Lucy, take Lucy out of this equation. (laughs) <laughs> all right thank you both for sharing those the, a question that I always ask our guests is um is about their unpopular opinion and I have stolen this from Greg James who uh, he would never listen to this podcast I don't think and if he does he might fully appreciate that I've ripped it off from him who knows but yeah I'd like to know um Lucy starting with you what is something that you agree you believe to be true but nobody else nobody else believes your your unpopular opinion I think um again this is quite personal um I have had debate, many debates with friends who are mums um, about being completely open and honest with your kids all the way through, whether you're going out, um, tell them you're going out, even if they cry, tell them the truth. And I've been like that all the way through. I've now got a 15 year old and a 12 year old. And for me, that's worked really, really well. But most people always say, oh, you know, I don't know if you should be really open and honest all the while. So that must probably be my unpopular opinion. Is that a an okay answer yeah that's a great answer yeah. again I don't know how unpopular that's going to be because I would have I would think that that's the right thing to do yeah okay or if not um uh raw no, mushrooms are nice <laughs> <laughs> I mean, game. that's okay. Like, I agree people. with you on that one, but a lot of people will, will find that very, very uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm, not very, I'm not very deep here, am I really? Um, I need that sea, so you can be deep. <laughs> so, uh, well, over to you, Sue. What's your unpopular opinion? I, I, I'm not sure I've got one. I'm a pretty kind of uncontroversial, black and white, what you see is what you get. But, um, I guess, and this is top secret really, because part of my role is um, hosting school visits as the learning manager and, and all about education and training and engagement. But I think my pop, my unpopular opinion is actually GCSEs don't really matter that much. So I see a lot of young people under a lot of pressure and they're really hyping it up. And you know, the reality is great if they can get maths and English, um, but have you ever, you know, has anyone ever given you a job based on your GCSE results? No, it's a, that's a really good answer as well. Mm-hmm. And actually, this, this is, it's, a, it's a topic that comes up over and over again when we ask this question. Not, not, you know, not always about GCSE results, but about, you know, university education or whether, you know, mainstream education actually works for everybody. And you're right. I don't even know if anyone's ever looked at my GCSE results. I don't, no, know that my, I don't know that my B in science ever did me any favours. <laughs> <laughs> Might now well, have sustainability plan. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I would just want them to come out as a well-rounded individual that, you know, that's confident and, and healthy at the end of the day because the pressure's on them at the moment and social media and mental health and all that kind of stuff, you know, they're growing up too quickly. So, yeah. I'm not telling my 15-year-old son that because he's revising really well at the moment so I'm not I'm not gonna tell him they don't matter don't let him listen to this podcast (laughs) keep keep that podcast from him for a while (laughs) now um a couple of weeks ago I read uh, one a LinkedIn post that one of your your marketing assistant Joanne Birch put out and it's really relevant to what we're going to talk about today I just want to read it out to you now she posted looking after the social media for a diverse 25,000 acre rural estate has its challenges Whilst our content is largely based around tourism and leisure, it is also important to share the stories from the wider estate, from farming, houses and forestry to landscapes, gamekeeping and reserve management. Now, that for me summed up the vastness of Holcombe Estates and it will have an impact on what we're going to talk about today and what a huge challenge this this has been been for you but Lucy I wondered if you could just give us an overview of Holcombe Estates for for our listeners that might not have have be aware of you or have, have visited there themselves I can okay so if you sort of picture it most of the time when you think about stately homes you picture a stately home with a garden um, for at Holcombe we are very much a landscape with a stately home so as you said we're 25,000 acres um, we have a national nature reserve a beach, beautiful beach. It's been in Shakespeare in Love. If you know the final scenes of Gwyneth Paltrow walking across the sands, that's Holcomb, absolutely stunning. Um, We're a farm, um, 
But at the sort of centre of that, we've also got our 18th century Palladian style mansion. And that's home to Lord and Lady Leicester um, and their family. So they live in the halls. It's a lived in family home. Um, but then we also have all of our visitor facing businesses. So we've got the hall, our Holcomb Stories experience, which is an attraction museum telling the sort of history and the now and the future of Holcomb. We've got a high ropes course, cycle hire, boat hire, <laughs> normally a really buzzing events calendar, um, <laughs> usually, obviously not this year, but it will be very busy and it's very exciting and very exciting for next year. Um, we have accommodations. So we've got the Victoria Inn. Um, which is near the beach. We've also got Pinewoods, um, which is a holiday park with caravans and lodges. Um, we have our self-catering lodges, which are within the park. Um, and then we've got farming, conservation, gamekeeping, land and properties. We've got nearly 300 properties on the estate that um, are tenanted. A lot of those people um, work for Holcomb or they, if not, they work in the local community. Um, we've got forestry. Um, and then we've got also... Um, officing where, where our land and property business is um that is home to lots of businesses and it's won lovely awards for the best place to work in the uk it's a stunning landscape that surrounds it and we've got i don't know if you've heard of her but monica binader which is a sort of global jewelry brand she's based at longlands at the mm. offices um she decided a few years back to base her whole business there um so she's got all of her shops around the world but that's where her business is and i think she's ahead of the times head of this year she sort of knew how um, wonderful it would be to be working there i suppose and not in a city center so um i hope that gives you a flavor but yeah i think it's twenty five thousand acres of beautiful landscapes um with a house in the middle <laughs> so, um, yeah and lots and lots of wildlife um too. i mean it it really is one of the most yeah. beautiful places and, and and that stretch of the world holds a really special place in our hearts it's it's somewhere that we visit very very frequently and it is it's stunningly beautiful um but so I'm just thinking, so you lead on the sustainability plan for the estate, which I'm sure, considering the vastness that we've just heard about, is no mean feat. Um, it's, that's what I'd really love to talk about today is, is how you've been able to do that and what that means. Um, I guess my first question is, how difficult has that been to, to, to put, in, put plans in place, considering what everything that's been happening in 2020? Has it had a huge effect on, on it? You know, how have you even been able to start? Yeah, but bizarrely, I would say um, COVID-19 had, had a bit of a positive spin in that environmental awareness has really increased. Um, people are a lot more passionate and, and aware of the disposable culture and that sort of thing. Um, my biggest challenge initially, so I sort of started the role in April, doing initial research, I started off visiting different teams, um, but then lockdown arrived in March, so I couldn't actually spend time on the ground, so that was a little bit frustrating. Um, and then in terms of building the strategy, it was probably six months of Zoom <laughs> with senior managers which uh, if anyone knows me, I don't really sit in front of a computer very much. So that was really interesting, though, because, you know, we've got a farm manager, we've got a conservation manager, a finance manager, and across all the different businesses, the one thing that was the thread that unites them together is sustainability. So it was, yeah, really interesting time, and it took sort of four or five months to really come together and what we would say is build that strategy because there's so much we, you know we could shoe on everyone's day-to-day -day job into it and and tick it as sustainability but so yeah it took about four months um, and now we're at the exciting stage where we communicate that with our teams so I've just been doing a workshop with some of the teams on the estate to share it with them uh, and then really get ready to deliver for 2021. And so what does that look like then? What does your sustainability plan look like for 2021? And has it changed dramatically since, you know, it was first conceived? No, I would say the, the shape is still there. So we've got three main themes. Um, one is pioneering environmental gain, which is all about connecting ecosystems and biodiversity and habitat. One is champion low carbon living which is all about carbon emissions, um, our impact on construction and housing, our leisure operations, that sort of thing, uh, and farming. And then the last one is the one that we always talk about, tread lightly, stamp out waste. So that's all about recycling, reducing um, single-use plastics, and that sort of thing. So those three themes are what we're running with for 2021. 
We've got three goals, which are quite ambitious as well. And for me, I just see 2021 as that year of change where we'll make an impact. So we've done quite a lot of talking uh, and rightly so. And we want to take our visitors on that journey and really start to chip away at those goals. And what, so with the goals that you've got, can you, can you share what they are and how you'd hope to achieve them with the sustainability plan? Yeah, absolutely. So the pioneering environmental gain, the goal is to increase natural capital with every decision that we make. So natural capital, if you're not aware, is soil, it's water, it's air quality, it's biological organisms. So everything in the environment that we as humans need. And what we want to do is increase that. So provide more homes for and habitats for birds and insects and pollinators, that sort of thing. Um, and then looking towards sort of construction as well. So, for example, if we're building four houses in Burnham Thorpe, we're now looking at a little meadow down in the village and let's improve the biodiversity there, but also give the public access. So a big thing for us is really bringing, it, uh, bringing nature to people uh, and really sort of engaging with them throughout. Yeah. So that's um, pioneering environmental gain. Champion low carbon living is one that you'll probably be pretty familiar with. We haven't decided to go for net zero. We haven't decided to be carbon neutral. We want to be carbon negative by 2040. So we want to take it that next step where we're actually taking in more carbon emissions than we're letting out. So that's quite a bold run. Oh, nice. uh, and key to that is agriculture. So our farms emit a lot of carbon through the use of artificial inputs, um, the belt of Galloways and our cattle are and birth a lot. So <laughs> and then also the diesel use from our big tractors and that sort of thing. So subtle changes to that farming system will be really important. And then all the kind of stuff that we know about, like saving energy, you know, we're going to look at a, a solar farm or solar panels. Um, moving over to electric vehicles, all kind of little changes that, that will make a big impact. And then the last one, tread lightly stamp out waste. The goal is to reduce uh, the amount of non-recycled goods on the estate by 10% a year for the next 10 years. So at the moment, we're kind of processing the COVID waste mountain because we had loads of all our cafeways went to takeaway. We had a, a great event called Feast in the Park which enable people to come out into the countryside uh, safely and, and have some food and drink. But again, that was all, all packaging, all takeaway stuff. So we're looking at our waste mountain, as I call it. But then ultimately, we want to reduce the amount of waste that we create. Yeah, that's a it's a really good point to raise that, actually. It's something that we talked about a few weeks ago, um, very briefly with Yael Koifman that was on, in terms of, I think that, that in the last few years, us as you know attractions but actually us as, as individuals we've made quite big steps forward in terms of what we're doing for sing, single use plastic I mean I'm really aware of what I'm doing just in my own home you know not buying vegetables that are wrapped in plastic and, and you know it's just small small changes like that marginal gains and unfortunately the COVID situation has meant a bit of a step backwards in that in terms of packaging single use plastic even down to you know we would we were discussing um when you go to the hairdressers now, you know, you, the, the robes that they put on you, they're single use plastic, they're going to get thrown away. And it's, it's, it's a real shame that that's happened. So it's, it's great that that's being acknowledged and something that you know that you're going to work on for the following year. What, what I'd love to know is how you get, how do you get the general public involved in this? Because, you, you know, you, you're a huge estate. And as Lucy mentioned earlier, you've got so many different um ways that people can visit or engage with what you do there how do you bring your audience uh how do you bring them into that sustainability plan and get them involved with it totally from from their pre-visit you know from the website um the, everyone just googles nowadays don't they straight onto the home page and um, so sustainability is on that front page which i think is really important um, and then what we're working on is a, a consistent messaging across all the businesses. So if you're staying at Pinewoods Holiday Park, the recycling bins look the same as if you come up to the Courtyard Cafe. So just making things really easy, making things really clear, and then using different media. So obviously social media is a great way of communicating with people. 
uh, interpretation on site as well. All of the sort of events that we run, we're looking at running a kind of green based event as well. So loads of different, every sort of touch point that they come across and through staff as well is really important. We just want to take them on the journey. Yeah, I think that staff point's really important as well, that I think, you know, we've, we're a team of 250 people and it should be, like she said, every touch point. So, you know, that's why Sue and Alex, our head of HR, are doing these big sort of staff training um, sessions to introduce our sustainability strategy and get everyone involved and make sure that everyone's informed and passionate about it and really energised because then they can, you know, we are a customer facing business. So, uh, you know, when the customers, whoever they're engaging with, whether they're buying coffee in the cafe or whether they're on a, a nature walk on the nature reserve, one of the team, that everybody is, you know, you know, talking the same talk and believing what we're doing and know what's happening and can, you know, engage everyone in it. So I think that's that's a really important point. Yeah, definitely. And that, that was one of my questions, actually, is how does that, how does the plan translate to visitors and their experience? But it, you know, actually, it, it starts with your internal team does yeah it's so important so I think that's you know without everybody's buy-in and it's actually we've got our vision we have a vision for Holcomb um, which is be the UK's most pioneering and sustainable rural estate um, and then under that we have our five great Holcomb behaviours and last year we made the decision that one of those would change and in that in its place is sustainability so it's actually a behaviour um, for us it's it's something that we, we need to be inherent that's something that we naturally do so every decision that we make on the estate whether it's to print something whether it's put a lid on a coffee whether it's the supplier we're using um yeah that sustainability has to be a natural instinct and that's what we're aiming for so and that's why it's so important to embed it with the team isn't it because there's so many different people involved in in decision makings throughout the throughout the estate each of them has to be fully aware of that sustainability plan to understand okay well what what decision do i make about what paper we order or what you know what suppliers we work with are they aligned to our plan as well it's a huge huge task isn't it but really exciting it's really exciting and also if we can whether visitors or one of those team members if they can also take that thinking home and start to make changes in their day-to-day lives and then they talk to other people and their friends and their family members and it's a ripple effect you know we and it is much more in the human psyche now thanks to David Attenborough and Covid and, uh, and we are talking about it more than ever before um, but it's actually taking action and making changes that's the important bit. So one of the things that you mentioned earlier is, is and this is this is coming back to how this translates to the visitor experience but you mentioned um, specific events around sustainability as well is that something that you're looking to do more of yet next year to kind of highlight the plan and to I guess bring you know bring your audience into it and make help them be part of it as well absolutely so I think in general uh, we have lots of tours in the hall and on the nature reserve so we'll be looking at incorporating that into those um, and then I'm going to let Sue chat about it but uh, yeah um, a, a green event we want to have um, a big event at Holcomb you know it's, it's our vision to be you know the most sustainable estate so and be pioneering which means that we want to you know um, bring people on that journey with us so yeah we're looking at introducing that next year um, and we hope it will grow but you know much like I suppose Glastonbury that's yeah. great a small <laughs> music festival yes. yeah so if we can you know have that span of growth that would be great um yeah I don't know if you've got anything to add to can you share any of the plans for this event because I mean love, I'd love to hear about it myself I'm sure our listeners would yes yeah, so well Lucy alluded to we have a year-round program Um, And we have a mantra, inform, inspire, influence. So, you know, be it guided walks on the National Nature Reserve or we do trailer tours, uh, explore with the experts, so where you can learn a little bit more detail, that sort of thing. So throughout our whole events programme, we have sort of what I guess would be called educational events, but they're really interesting. And and so we'll layer sustainability throughout those. Um, This individual event, we're looking at starting fairly small and really influencing local tenants and the local community and really looking at pioneering environmental gain. That's an area where we've got opportunities. I think we're already ahead of the game in some respects. Um, And then we'd like to build it as a lifestyle event 
but obviously, you know, at the moment, we don't know if you can have 500 people together or 10,000. So we're going to start small uh, and build it up, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's a challenge in itself, right? Trying to plan anything in advance at the moment. We have no clue what's coming. We are... I'd like to understand a little bit about how you measure the effectiveness of, of the plans. And I think um, I, actually what would be really interesting is maybe to get you back on at the end of next year to see how these plans have developed and what's come from it. But yeah, I mean, Lucy, how do you how do you measure the effectiveness of it? Well, I think there's two different sort of uh, focuses here, but what overrides all of it is data is king. So I think that we're at the moment um, undergoing, we're nearly finished doing our first big carpeting audits of every business. So that's land businesses, but also all the leisure businesses as well, because we really need to know where we are right now, because I don't think you can really set goals and informed goals and also track your progress and measure your progress all the way through um, without knowing where where your starting point is so that's really important particularly with our carbon goal Um, and then from there we're going to measure and track all the way through so we've got lots of systems whether it's in farming um, but we're going to measure and track and then that most probably will adjust our goals because at the moment we're saying we'd like to be carbon negative by 2040 we may well be better than we think or we could be worse you know we just don't know so that's you know that's really really important and then in terms of marketing I suppose that's my um you know subset that's what I'm looking after it's our web traffic it's our social growth our e-news engagement um we'll be doing online and on-site surveys to find out if people are engaged where they're at what they want to find out about about more um you know our PR coverage it's everything um and then as you said it's having those times where you review so like you're saying you'd like to chat with us next year find out you know where we've got to have we um you know surpassed some of our goals and then others we're struggling with it'll be really interesting but that's definitely a review and I think that's where Sue's role is so important because um she's yeah herding sheep I don't think she is they're all amazing <laughs> but it's but all the general managers of all the different businesses they could have all gone off on their own tact with their own goals sure. but what Sue's done is brought everyone together we're all working towards the same strategy and goals um, and it makes it then an estate vision and, and objectives so I think that's really important and it's wonderful to work with all the businesses yeah. as well so you've united everyone under a under a, a, a goal this is lovely <laughs> Well, as I mean, as when people go onto our website and see our film for um, for our sustainability, we've titled it Wonder um, because we we feel we are a place of wonder. You sort of stand in awe. We're beautiful, um, but you also wonder what it could look like if you don't do anything about it. If you don't look at sustainability, so Wonder is our sustainability campaign. It's the title of our strategy, and Sue is our Wonder Woman. Oh, that's, she that's a- is. <laughs> She's going to hate that. <laughs> Sorry, Sue. Sue yeah, I'm, I'm going to get you a mug. I'm going to send yeah. you a wonderful um, mug because I think you need to keep that on your desk all day long. Yeah, I was sustainability Sue, so I'm not, not sure which is worse. <laughs> well, I think Wonder Woman is, is a little bit, yeah. you know, that's, I think that's, I, that's power. A mug and a cloak. I think they need both. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure Sue's keen on that. I don't think the cloak's going to go down very well. All no. <laughs> the gold boots. Anyway, continue. <laughs> well, it would be interesting to know what advice you can offer to, to any of our listeners that will potentially be going through this process themselves or thinking about how they can make, you know, we, we talked about small marginal gains that where you can make things increase, you know, better and better and better over time. Are there any advice that you could share with our listeners in, in, in terms of how they start or begin to look at sustainability? Well, interesting. I was chatting with Lord Lester yesterday about the subject um, and we were sort of agreeing that I think you definitely need to know where you are, particularly as a business, you need to know where you are because then you can set your goals in a realistic fashion. And I think the one thing to remember um, is that you it has to be realistic because you need to set goals that you can financially deliver because if they're not financially viable then you're not going to be here as a business to deliver them and what we're also finding and talking to other businesses is that actually quite a lot of the sustainability gains that you can make are actually um, financial ones too um, so because you always probably cut down on some of your resources that you're using you'll think better you'll work smarter so it's just I think that's something to definitely 
um, remember that it has to be sustainable in all ways, socially, financially and environmentally. So that's definitely some key advice. Um, and I think be authentic. Um, there's a lot of talk around greenwashing. Um, don't be guilty of thinking, um, wow, this is something we really should do and we're going to do it and just talk about it. It has to be authentic. So really think about where you can make some um, the the biggest changes environmentally for sustainability um, and focus on those and um, just make sure, yeah, it's like us really, we're saying we're launching our sustainability strategy, but actually for the past 10 years, we've, now, we've got a 100 acre solar farm, we've got an anaerobic digester, we heat the hall and all of our businesses with um, uh, wood chip, so we've got our biomass boilers. So we've been doing it for quite a long time without telling anyone, um, but what we're now doing is saying, actually, that's not even enough. We need to up it further. So, yeah, I, that's the thing. I think it just has to be authentic and realistic. That's yeah, and from my point of view, I'm, I'm a bit of a doer, doer, not a talker. So don't get bogged down. It's, it could be absolutely overwhelming. And I think when I was first approached um, by my boss here, uh, I was just like, wow, because it isn't just rubbish. It's it's every single business. It's huge. Um, but from my point of view, small differences can make a really big impact. Um, and keep chipping away at it because solutions are out there. There's loads of people doing really cool things. Um, and, you know, every night I'm on Google looking up something else or going down another rabbit hole because I've seen something on Twitter. So for me, every day is a school day. But um yeah, get stuck in and, and collaborate with other like-minded people. You know, you, at, nowadays you're not considered swampy because you're talking about sustainability. It's actually, <laughs> well, you know, it's totally, totally on brand, isn't it? And, and let's not reinvent the wheel. If we can learn from other people, then let's do that. But I mean, go for it. Literally every single individual can make a difference. Oh, Sue, so that's, yeah, you've just got me right there, Sue. So. And I think, you you know, what you said about collaborating and learning for people, that has been something that's so key this year. People are so willing to share their plans. They're so willing to share what they're doing and how they're doing things, especially within this sector. There's always somebody that's doing or, or you know, a couple of steps ahead of you that you can learn from. And people are so, so willing to to kind of give up that that advice and their time at the moment as well. So definitely that's that's a key one for me. Ask people, ask people for help, ask people how to do things. Lovely. Yeah. Thank you both so much. I cannot wait to see what happens next year. I'm really excited. I'm going to be at that green event for sure. Yes, we all get an invitation, a special one. You have a special <laughs> oh, invitation. Thank you. I might even bring Doris, my, my dog, who has kindly not barked through the whole of this podcast. Thanks, Doris. <laughs> <laughs> now, we always end the podcast by asking our guests about a book that they'd recommend. So, um, have you got a, a book each that you'd recommend that you you either just love or it's maybe helped shape your career in some way? Okay, from me, I could have just been, I love Bren Brown and all of um, the books that have been published. They're really helpful. Um, but I, <laughs> I'm going to change my Shadow. I've actually got it here. I brought it in with me today. Oh, that's a great um, book. Yeah, so Nigel Slater's The Kitchen Diaries, because I'm a bit of a foodie. Um, and I think that you need to be nourished well, because if you're fed well, if you feed yourself well, and you really, and again, it's about sustainability, it's about knowing where your food comes from, um, you then perform better. So if you want to do really well at your job and in life in general, you need to look after yourself. So yeah, Nigel Slater's The Kitchen Diaries. Um, it's a very scattered book. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I love Nigel Slater. I think it's an inspiration. Um, yeah, and he calms me down at the end of the day because uh, so I can get quite excited. He um, has a so... beautiful garden as well. He has a really beautiful garden. Whenever I see that on telly, I'm like... That's the garden of dreams. It's so it neat, and beautiful, and lovely. Oh, he's got a great, great kitchen. He, yeah, he relocated his kitchen, and he's down the depths of his kit where the old kitchen used to be, and it's yeah, a bit of a sanctuary. So yeah, I'm a bit of a stalker of Nigel Slater. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well maybe maybe he's listening, and he'll run a mile now. <laughs> yeah, he will. <laughs> Sue, what about you? Do you have one you can share with us? Well, really, any Osborne book that's got a lift flap for my <laughs> four-year-old son. So we love reading anything about science or farm machinery. But um, 
pull it back to sustainability. It's a bit of a cliche, but um, there's an awesome book called Dirt to Soil by Gabe Brown. Um, and it's all about regenerative agriculture um, and how he turned the, an American dust bowl into a, a sustainable farm that can grow crops and repair the soil. And it's all the kind of ethos that we, we're delivering over here. So yeah, really inspiring. And I haven't got it to show you because I've passed it on to someone in my team to read. Oh, I love that. That's what you should do with books. They're never to be thrown. They're always to be kept or passed on. Oh, yeah, great. that's a really good read. Uh, uh, brilliant book choices I love that they're on topic as well because as you know we give these books away as prizes so again if you'd like to win a copy of these books and if you head over to our Twitter account skip the queue and you retweet this episode announcement then with the comment I want Lucy and Sue's books then you'll be in a chance with winning them and so if you have got a really keen interest in sustainability this is the podcast for you to enter that competition on because you I don't think you could have got two better books Thank you. I cannot wait to come and see what you guys do next year. Um, just before we leave, can you let us know where's the best place to see what you're up to? Is it your website? It's our website and all of our social channels. And um, yeah, and join our e-newsletter. You know, join join the database so that you receive the e-news. Um, at the moment, you might get a little bit bombarded by Christmas, um, but a lot of that sustainable Christmas. So um, it's, it's really nice to read. But yeah, definitely yeah, head over to our homepage. You can yeah, sign up there um, yeah, and watch the launch film, which is wonderful. And Sue and I this afternoon are about to go and record the second film. There you go. So okay. head over yeah. to the web. And what's the website? We'll put all of the links in the show notes. But just to, what's the website domain for yeah. us, Lucy? Holcomb.co.uk. There you go. Thank you both for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure finding out about what's happening and getting to know you both. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. And don't hold fire. If the restrictions allow, Kelly, come come to Holcomb before this time next year. I will be there. No worries about that, Sue. (laughs) Thanks for listening to Skip the Queue. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a five star review. It really helps others find us. And remember to follow us on Twitter for your chance to win the books that have been mentioned. Skip the Queue is brought to you by Rubber Cheese, a digital agency that builds remarkable systems and websites for attractions that helps them increase their visitor numbers. You can find show notes and transcriptions from this episode and more over on our website, rubbercheese.com forward slash podcast.